for 20 years, no one can tell me what taxes is going to be 20 years later. We can't even talk about inflation for six months. Forget about inflation for 20 years. <laughs>
every company and every country. And therefore, whether it's in the immediate term, short term, medium term, or long term, all of us, not just policymakers, should pay due attention to demographics because it affects all of us. Mm. So on that, on that note, what are some of the demographic shifts you're seeing, uh, whether it be the younger generation or, or the older generation, that perhaps we um, are not taking seriously enough? The fastest growing age group in the world is 80 plus. So they are the fastest growing age group. They are growing at five, six times the normal population change. But they are also the most demanding of public resources mm -hmm. based on pensions or social security, healthcare, and long-term care. Roughly 80% of the taxes of Europe go on paying for people uh, in the 65 plus age group uh, on pensions, healthcare, long-term care. But if the fastest growing age group is 80 plus, then policymakers, industrialists, academics need to think about the very old because they are gobbling up resources to tackle MS, ME, Parkinson's, cancer, and lots of other things. While they are growing very fast, another generation is also growing very fast, which are the millennials and the post-millennials. And their behavior is very different. The younger generation of 9 to 12 wants to have nothing to do with Facebook. They are going for another kind of framework, which I think is Roblox or something. And we need to understand the young and the old, but not just in terms of age, in terms of behavior, because in terms of behavior, an 18-year-old in Zimbabwe can be more similar than an 18-year-old in London, and at the same time, an 18-year-old in Birmingham could be very dissimilar to an 18-year-old in London. Yeah. And those changes were, are what we need to understand. Just hankering on age is a mischaracterization is wrong and is misleading us. So looking at different generations to try and understand their consumption and work is more important than trying to just bucket them into different age groups. You spoke about the millennials and the older generation getting older and what a burden they could possibly be on, for lack of another expression, taxpayers' money. So, um, but I also understand your point that it's not all about age. But at some point, don't policymakers need to address the fact that people are living longer by increasing the retirement age? Because we seem to be having um, the, a demographic shift of people living longer now, but still laws that are in place that are allowing people to retire at whatever it is, 57 or 60, when really it should be more like 65 or 70 to keep pace with the amount of uh, medical advancements we're making. Yeah, exactly. In the first publication I did in the year 2000, which more than 47 governments use as change in retirement age, the first three words in the demographic manifesto were abolish mandatory retirement, replace it with flexible, enabled retirement, which should be linked to life expectancy. So lots of countries mm. have now adopted it, and life expectancy is being linked to retirement ages. Also in the oldest of countries, like Japan, Switzerland, Germany, older retired people are re-entering the workforce working part-time, part-year, part-week. And that is a big plus for society because they are sharing their pearls of wisdom by way of experience, complementing the youthful dynamism of the younger people who are already in the workforce. Mm -hmm. And that's a win-win. And U.S. benefits from that because U.S. has one of the most youthful uh, dynamics in terms of the workforce, but if it were to garner the experience of the people who are retired and like Japan, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, bring back some of those people to get a good combination or partnership of youthful dynamism along with expertise, that would really be very good. So retirement ages ought to be banished. Mm. And we are seeing people live longer all over the world thanks to medical advances, thanks to industrialization, but also thanks to the fact that men and women are having fewer children, so they devote better energy to those one or two children, and the survival rates are also higher, rather than seven or eight children as they used to have in Burkina Faso or Afghanistan or Pakistan or uh, India in earlier uh, decades. Now, all those countries, there has been a reduction in the birth rate to three to four children, and even there, they're concentrating resources on helping the kids survive, and that's thanks to good transmission globally of knowledge and information. So yes, I would contradict the common folklore that deglobalization is happening, because today, people sitting in the poorest villages of Nepal, Burkina Faso, Ghana, India, as well as Sierra Leone, 
know of best practices that people are adopting to deal with COVID. So information flow, investment flow is global. Yes, people may not be um, traveling as much. Yes, trade of goods may not be happening. But today, you see somebody who is in South Africa, they could own stocks in mm -hmm. Korea, or they could own stocks in Canada or US, or, and even digital assets just sitting in Zimbabwe. And that is something which attests to the fact that globalization is happening, but it's changed. If you just take a very narrow vision of globalization, then you would think it's tapering off. That's a very interesting point you've made. I, I actually haven't heard others say that, that um, globalization is continuing in a, in, a, in a digital form. It's only in the physical form that deglobalization is, is showing signs. And that, that's a very interesting point you made. I, I hadn't heard that before. But I just wanted to go back to something you were uh, saying and, and, and ask you about this, because I know that um, pensions and retirements and savings will become a problem uh, if people keep living longer and the retirement age doesn't, doesn't change. But, but on the flip side, as you say, you have a millennial generation who just don't naturally feel like saving for retirement. It's, it's, a gen it's more of a generational thing. What is the pushback from governments then from moving the retirement age? You say that you are a proponent of abolishing that mandatory retirement age. Why are governments not doing that? Because it seems like a fairly obvious move to do to try and alleviate the pressures. Oh, great question. Part of it is governments are bound by the fact that older people vote a lot more. Ah. And so the political power lies with the gray-haired people. And if you wanted to look at the last US elections, 2016 or 2020, I argued that people above 70, more than 70% 70 of them voted. But in the age group 25 to 34, you had roughly one third voting. So if everything is skewed towards older people, European, US, and other governments are scared on cutting down benefits of the old people or changing their retirement ages, etc. But in the more progressive countries, in Nordic countries, they've linked retirement ages to life expectancy, and see, as well as in countries like Netherlands, etc., there's a big pushback to people that you cannot preclaim your retirement benefits. You need to, in fact, work and if you're capable mm. physically of working later you should kind of work later but i must say one of the key things in a paper i wrote along with 17 18 different companies uh, is a report called age of responsibility in which we argued that all countries are really short of savings and the average saving rate in larger countries to deal with the promises which have already been made should be actually 15%, and most countries are saving hardly 5 or 6%. So education and incentives for saving are necessary. So increase in interest rates are very important because older people, when they see interest rates close to zero or negative, they are trying to put all the money under the mattress. Mm. And that's why monetary policy is very ineffective in a gray aging world. A paper I wrote along with IMF, and most people don't pay attention to it, I believe central bankers are largely very ineffective in a world which is uh, growing old because old people aren't investing and reacting to those interest rates. If interest rates are zero and they go to 0 0.25 or 0 0.5, it doesn't matter. Old people in Japan are investing in emerging markets funds. They're investing in credit. They're not investing in these kind of safe government assets because they are living beyond what people expected them to live. This is possibly a, an inflammatory question, but I'll ask it anyway. We can always take it out. When it comes to voting about the future, there was some debate, particularly with Brexit in the UK, about whether the young should have more of a say than a vote. I mean, you're talking about democracy, and now I'm, I'm, I'm talking about democracy. Um, but uh, is there any argument to say that those people who are going to live in the world 10, 20, 30 years out should have more of a vote about that future? Well, I've addressed this not once. I've addressed this 10 years ago, so it's not a new question to me. In fact, in Boston, I went and argued in Fidelity, um, posing a discussion that I'd had dinner time with one of my students, saying that, yes, and it was her idea, she said that I have 70 years to live, Amlan. I'm 30, and let's say my mother has only something like 45 years to live, so her vote should count for 0.45, and my vote should count for uh, 0.7. What do you and say to that? weighted average. I think uh, it is very meritorious, and if we start giving more consideration to younger people, that would be good, because I believe one of the things which has disadvantaged 
young people and the productivity of young people and their engagement in society is, uh, we have given far greater resources to baby boomers and older, mm -hmm. and that is the biggest tragedy or mistake of corporate governance has been defined benefit pension plans. So I will tell you the biggest mistake and a question that no one has answered to me to date, and I will give you that question. Let's say you say, Amlan, you're age 65, retire today. And let's assume that somebody else comes and say, so Amlan, you're going to die when you're 85. You have 20 years of retirement. How much money do you need for 20 years retirement? Not a single person in the world in more than 600 conferences has answered this to me. This includes global leaders, Nobel laureates, university professors, actuaries, investors, etc. Why? Because for 20 years, even the best of gurus cannot tell me what inflation will be. Mm. For 20 years, no one can tell me what taxes is going to be 20 years later. We can't even talk about inflation for six months. Forget about inflation for 20 years. Over 20 years, we don't know where bond yields will be, where equity premia will be. And lastly, you don't know where I'm going to retire. If I retire in a village where I grew up or uh, in the northeast of India, my money could last for 100 years. Yeah. If I retire in London, my money could last for 25 years. If I retire instead in Delhi, then my money could uh, last for 40 years. You don't know where we're going to retire. So it's a very big question, how much money do we need for 20 or 30 years? Most people think they know the answer. We don't. So what can we do? I need to monitor very closely over shorter periods, break down the 20 years into three years, three years, three years, and then focus on have I spent more money? How much do I have? And that's why mm -hmm. the older Japanese and older Italians, many of them are investing their money in a bit riskier asset profile because they know that at age 70, an average Japanese person has a 70% chance of living beyond 90. And they want their money to grow rather than be invested in assets which are declining right. or close to zero as we see in the Japanese economy. Yeah, I mean, it would sound counterintuitive for someone at 70 to invest in equities, but I, I completely understand your point. Um, now, I want to go back to something uh, you said about uh, population growth. Um, there are people out there, um, Elon Musk is one of them, uh, who thinks that one of the biggest problems we're facing um, is a labor market shortage because people are not really having um, enough children. Do you see that, are you in the same camp that you think the declining population is a problem for us? I don't think there's a declining population. It's declining population growth, which is very different than declining okay. population. So currently we have probably close to about 8.2 billion people. I believe there are enough resources, contrary to other people, that we can support populations of 9 billion to 10 billion. But Elon Musk has a point. Why are people having fewer children? People are having fewer children because as women get educated, they find they want to give a better future for mm -hmm. their children. That means having one or two kids and sending them to the best of universities, providing them with the best of human capital so that poorer countries can generate the demographic dividend. And the demographic dividend is something which emerging markets largely allude to, and it happened in the Asian tiger economies in the 1990s. It refers to GDP per capita growth increases. GDP per capita growth increases happen when the population goes down, women are having fewer children, but at the same time, GDP grows. Why? Because you've educated your kids better, they are far more productive, and they are bringing back better pay packages and better, uh, let's say, income prospects for the future. What do you see, um, if you look at over the next six to 12 months, there's a lot of geopolitical tensions as well. Um, how do you see the sort of markets from here sort of panning out? Oh, the, um, the elephant in the room is inflation. Mm -hmm. And uh, research from Deutsche Bank looking at 800 years showed that inflation is largely determined by demographics over the last eight centuries. However, they miss a point because they only look at the demand side. As consumers, we demand lots of goods and services, whether it's bread, it's whole food, it's pork, it's fish, whatever, or it's iPads, or it is satellite trips, etc., etc. And demand relative to supply decides price. Inflation is change in the average price level. So there are two things which matter out there. What is the average consumer consuming? And secondly, how is the average price increasing? So when oil prices go up, there are some countries which are benefiting, and others which are oil uh, importers, they are losing out. Similarly, thanks to supply chains, 
food, there are food shortages because in a lot of economies, emerging economies, they are still suffering the effects of dislocated labor. And I don't mm -hmm. find people talking about it. It's something I made a call February 26th of 2020, that COVID is worse than the global financial crisis because it's affecting each and every individual in the world. The mm -hmm. global financial crisis affected only few rich economies. Please get that right. Mm -hmm. Not every economy. Mm -hmm. Whereas COVID is, a, is an aggregate shock. When you get an aggregate shock, then supply goes down and demand goes down. Mm. So some countries, we did see inflation temporarily. Some in countries we saw prices remain the same and some go down. But currently what we are seeing largely is inflation. And that inflation is coming because of supply shocks compounded by the fact that demand may have gone down or stayed the same. And those supply shocks are largely a, an, a consequence of geopolitics, of the power play, mm -hmm. and the hegemonic battle between China and United States. And it is regarding who's the bigger power. That's going to determine a lot of what happens in technology. And China is growing its own universities to compete with US, who I think is the mecca of human capital. And in the top 10 universities in terms of research patents, now you see Chinese universities. They were nowhere there. In the 80s and 90s, when we were studying in uh, US and teaching in US, uh, most Chinese and Indian students came to study at Stanford, MIT, Caltech, Berkeley to learn all the computer science, etc. Now, a lot of the Chinese students are going to Chinese universities, which are also innovating. So right. where that battle goes is going to be one thing. And where inflation goes, I think a bit of inflation is good. 2 to 5% inflation is good because interest rates would be high, then older people would save, financial markets would grow, we would also see a growth nexus. These last two decades where central bankers have done loads and loads of QE, we've heard in lots of panels, and I'm a firm believer that QE has had very limited effect. It has had effect on financial markets, but not the same effect on labor markets and on growth. So. If QE has not had that kind of effect, now when we reverse QE, we shouldn't. And a bit of inflation is good because capital is absolutely mispriced. What does capital mean? So we have four factors of production, land, labor, capital, enterprise in any economy. The price of land is rent. The price of labor is wages. The price of capital is interest rates. And the price of entrepreneurship is profits. That is the basics of economics. And what we have totally overturned over the last 20 years is the fact that capital, which is the price or marginal productivity of capital, which should be equal to interest rates, that's been broken. So today I can borrow for, from you for two years, and I can borrow from that gentleman for 10 years, but it's quite possible that for 10 years I'm paying a lower interest rate than two years, and that should never happen. Interest rates should be on an upward sloping yield curve. Second thing is we really need to compensate for capital because otherwise money is not priced. Mm. And I do believe that's thanks to absence of fiscal policy, central bankers and monetary policy people have become far too influential. And therefore what we need is structural policies and changes just like Japan did. Change education, change the labor system, change the infrastructure policy, change the environmental policy, change the digital policy, in addition to fiscal and monetary policy, so that we see wholesale policy changes bringing us up to a better equilibrium. Amran, thank you very much. Such insightful thoughts, and I really appreciate your time and, uh, and chatting with you. It's a pleasure to, uh, talking to you, Jamie, and thanks to you, and thanks to the organizers for allowing me a forum to further express my views.